Good morning, church. We are finishing up our series on identity. I hope it has been a blessing to you. I spent a lot of time this last week just in prayer uh, for those who have been listening and following on along in this series. I know there are several people that are following along online. We have people that are uh, checking in from Virginia and Texas that are following in with this series, and we're thankful, uh, hopefully, that this series has been a blessing to them as well. And as we close out, I want to remind you there. There's nothing more important for us when it comes to Scripture than finding our identity in Christ. That's what Paul wrote time and time and time and time and time and time again, reminding who you are in Christ. Your identity has been transferred. Your identity has been delivered from the domain of darkness. You are now the redeemed of Christ And that calls with it a lifestyle. But today we're going to continue that series, wrap up that series, talking a little bit about sainthood. But before we dive into that, let's bow in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, you are faithful to us. God, you are good to us. And we are so thankful for your goodness. God, it becomes difficult at times to lift our eyes past the horizontal world that we live in, to see the glory of heaven. Father, there are so many distractions, and time and time again in Scripture we read about the deceitfulness of skin, how sin, how it puts a mask over us, puts blinders on us. And Father, we see it in the lives of other people. It's just sometimes we don't see it in our own lives. And so God, it's our prayer this morning. It's our humble plea this morning that you would take the blinders off of us. Father, that our heart would allow you to do that for us. Father, that we wouldn't stand in pride before your throne, but Father, that we would listen attentively to your message. Father, to discover who we are in Christ. Father, that we would realize that because of what you've done, it has changed everything for us. Father, you are, you are not asking things of us. You are merely calling us to remember who we actually are. And Father, from that position to act. God, we pray for those who are down in Gatlinburg this week. And Father, we pray for their safe passage home. And God, that uh, they have enjoyed their trip. God, that the message that was proclaimed there is one that will sink deeply into the hearts of our students and the thousands of others that were down in Gatlinburg this week. Father, we pray that our students enjoyed each other's company and that relationships were built that will last a lifetime. Father, we ask that uh, you be with us now as we enter into this time of study. Father, as you call us into your holy place and remind us that you have made us holy because you are holy. God, we love you. We thank you. It is my prayer that you'd be merciful upon the speaker this morning for his sins are many. God, may he not stand in the way of your perfect message. Father, whatever is of him may be blown away like the chaff. God, thank you again for your grace. It's in your son's precious and holy name we pray, and the church said, amen. Amen. I would venture to guess that most Christians are at least familiar with the feeling of Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. Maybe you don't know the background. Maybe you can't quote the text. But it would be my guess that most of you here this morning would at least be familiar with the feeling of Isaiah 6, 5. It is a feeling of unworthiness. It was probably best communicated by a guy that I met once named Terry. Terry was not a believer. Terry was married to this beautiful 
woman named Debbie. When I met Terry, Terry was coming off his third DUI. And he was in my office, actually here at the building. And he was reflecting on his life, the choices that he had made, the decisions that led him up to this point. And as he's doing this general reflection, he starts to think about this beautiful woman that has covenanted herself to him. And he came to the conclusion that he had no idea why she was still with him. I mean, really all he offered her was grief. Really all he offered her was one giant headache after another. He sat there in my office Time and time and time, bringing up example after example after example, almost as if he was a prosecuting attorney on a case. He told me of a time when, during their anniversary, rather than taking her out, he was at the bar. That was the night he got a second DUI. Yet she still continuously, faithfully, lovingly bore with him. Time and time and time again, he said, I have failed this woman. I just don't get it. And then he said the thing that I think really echoed the cry of his heart, the question of his heart. Why would a woman like that stay with a guy like me? I've asked a question like that before. Maybe you have too. It's that moment when you realize just how holy our God is, only to get punched in the gut with a reminder of how at times unholy you in the flesh can be. This is the scene of Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. The holiness of God is being demonstrated. And when we find ourselves in those moments, we reflect on a story that has been lived out, one marked by sin, marked by failure, marked by mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake. It's so clear in our mind the time that we yelled at our child. The time when we did that thing that didn't really breathe out integrity. It's that moment when your spouse looks at you and in frustration you respond. It was a choice that you made back in high school that day that you chose the bottle rather than prayer. Our heart convicts us, it condemns us, it continues almost like a prosecuting attorney to bring them up, does it not? Sin after sin after sin floods your memory, especially in light and in contrast of a holy God. You know, one thing that I've found out in my short number of years doing ministry is that a number of Christians are familiar with the law of God, they're just not very familiar with the grace of God. We feel the condemnation of the law breathing down our neck, almost like our, our neck is out on the chopping block and we can feel the blade right at the back, God's wrath, ready to be poured out on us. Failure, mistake, problem, that's what you are. You hear it whispered. You just don't measure up. Oh, what you could be, but you're not. The husband you could be, but you're not. Yes, underneath the sun of the glory and holiness of God, our sins become apparently clear. This is the context of Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. Here's how the text reads. In the year that King Uzziah died, 
I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am a lost, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Broken. Isaiah has this picture of the glory of heaven. He's ushered into the throne of God. And there, seated in the temple, on his throne, high and lifted up, is the Lord, the Creator God, the Holy One that knows no sin, the One that cannot be tempted. Sitting on the throne as king. Isaiah will describe him saying that the train of his robe fills the temple. Now this really means nothing to us, but it meant something to Isaiah's listeners. See, in Isaiah's time, the way that a king would demonstrate his power and his prestige was the length of his train, of his robe. And Isaiah says, God's train fills the whole temple. Here's the picture that Isaiah is communicating out. This is what I see. This is a king that is above every other king. This is a king that has more power than any other king. This is a king that is worthy of respect more than any other king. High and lifted up in his complete glory and above him, there are these angelic beings. Now, the scriptures don't properly describe them to us. We know that they have six wings, which is really creepy. With two, they cover their face. With two, they cover their feet. And with two, they fly. But it does give us a picture that they're powerful. There in verse four, you see they call out to one another. They call out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. In verse four, it says that the foundation of the temple shakes at their voice. At their voice. Not God's voice, these angelic beings' voices. Now I want to give you a a picture of this. I want to try to paint a picture. Zach, if you will. This is the foundational wall of the western wall in Jerusalem. The guy that's standing up there, he, he's a tour guide, and so he walks around and shows people these different things. The Western Wall is the Wailing Wall where Jews will go and they'll pray. That's just one big stone. Look at that thing. That's one giant piece of stone. It actually says one giant stone. That is a big hunk of rock. And Isaiah says, these angels beings declare out the praises of God, and as they're crying it out, The foundations, these stones, shake. Imagine the power behind that voice. And what is their message? Holy, holy, holy. As if one time is not enough. It's almost like these angelic beings, they start to stutter in the presence of God. Holy, holy, holy. (laughs) Because if there's one one characteristic that describes God, you you could possibly make an argument, it's holiness. The word holy 
is literally the idea that God is set apart. That you have all of us. I won't even be up there. All of us, and you have God. God is completely different than all of us. We are marked by sin. We are marked by sorrow. We are marked with frailties, but not God. God is completely set apart. He is perfect. He is holy, holy, holy. It does something to you. That's why that hymn is so powerful. Holy, holy, holy. That's why sometimes down deep in your heart when you're really feeling that song, when you're really ushered in and you start to grant, your mind gets the idea that you are in the presence of God, you just get this feeling like, man, I just need a drop because that's what happens. Look throughout scripture what happens when people come into God's presence. What do they do? Down, 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 down because the king is here. See, this is the only proper place in the presence of a king. But this is a king unlike any other king. This is a God that is bigger and better than any other idolatrous God. This God is holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of his glory. Romans will say that creation itself bears out that there is a God. Look around. We could have stopped the snow if we wanted to. There's nothing we could have done. There's no way we could hold back the clouds. They just come in. God's power is demonstrated. His holiness is demonstrated. And so Isaiah has a response there in verse 5. In light of the holiness of God, seeing who God is. Guys, this lesson will mean nothing to you if you do not allow your heart to take you there. If you do not let the Spirit convict you to bring you into the presence of God, you are no longer here. You are in the presence of a holy, perfect God. This is where Isaiah is. He is in the presence of a perfect, holy God. And so his response is what? Oh, woe is me. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. Isaiah looks at himself, and he says, there's no way I should be here. I know me. Listen up, church. I know me. I don't deserve to be here. I'm a man of unclean lips. Now what's interesting is that earlier on in the chapter, Isaiah sets the context with saying it was that in the year of King Uzziah died. You guys remember King Uzziah? King Uzziah was the only king ever recorded in scripture that ended up a leper. And so actually, if you go back to 2 Chronicles 26, verse 21, you're going to see this picture of this king, this one who is supposed to be set apart from the people to lead the people. He is handed over to this leprous disease. And so what does this king have to do for the rest of his life? Well, let me tell you what lepers would do if you've forgotten. Lepers in that time within Jewish heritage, they would cover their lips And what does Isaiah say? I'm a man of unclean lips. This king, the representative of the people, was unclean. Ceremonially, he would spend out the rest of his days unclean. And so as he would walk around amongst the people in the palace of Israel, he would have to declare as people would come up, unclean, unclean unclean. And this is the declaration of Isaiah. 
Woe is me, man of unclean lips. I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. You know what, guys? I'm jacked up, and guess what? You are too. I have baggage, but you do too. Let me remind you that your preacher has problems. But before you cast a stone, let me remind you, you do too. Isaiah looks out over the people and he says, there's not a single one of us that deserves to be in this place. When it comes to the holiness of God in our flesh, there's not a single one of us that's done it good enough. Remember the Dr. Terry illustration I used a couple weeks ago? 98% is an ace in a test. Guys, being honest with myself, I haven't even scored a 98 on God's test. I don't think I did above average. I don't even think I got average. Maybe I'm not the moral preacher that you guys deserve. I'm a broken man. I'm a man that has stories. I'm a man that has past sin. And guess what? Look at me. You are too. I know you want to deflect. I know it's in our general nature to try to think good about ourselves, but guess what? You carry baggage. Outside of Christ, in the flesh, you carry baggage and you know it. And so we have these Isaiah moments, do we not? These moments where we look at our lives and we say, We are unworthy. God, I am unclean, unclean, unclean because you are holy, holy, holy. And here's how I say this, see this work out. I see people run away from church when there are problems because they're not feeling spiritual, feeling good enough. I see people Goofy comments like, well, what do you expect? I'm only human. That's just Kylie being Kylie or Dan being Dan. What do you expect out of Charlie? Because we're unclean. There's a brokenness in us. And yet we forget the rest of that passage. We immediately jump over to the mission that is commissioned to Isaiah and we neglect the next couple of verses. Here is how Isaiah continues. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Church, listen to this. Behold, this has taken, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Let me read that again. Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Church, did you hear it? Your guilt has been taken away. Now, I've committed the offense, right? This is kind of stupid that my guilt has been taken away because I've done the deed. And yet, God, in his supremacy, says, you know, 
your guilt is taken away. We will see where that guilt goes to a little later on in the New Testament as we dive into our Mark series. Because of substitutionary atonement, because of Christ, he takes our guilt to the cross. A little bit later on in our summer series, we're going to be going through the book of Hebrews. Uh, Brett Howard, who was our preaching intern, and myself, we're going to work through the book of Hebrews. The Son of God died. He took away your sin, your guilt has been removed. It's not on you anymore. See, the condemnation that you feel, it was paid at the cross. The wrath of God that you so often put on yourself, it was poured out on the Son of God. See, our method of trying to respond to God should not be dwelling on our sin and our condemnation. It should be reflecting on the good news of the gospel that grace has been extended through the payment that has been delivered through Jesus Christ. And so he says, your guilt is taken away. There's a judgment scene. And you're no longer guilty. Think about your sin, church. Really take a moment, dwell hard on it. Close your eyes if you need to, look up at the sky. Think about your guilt, church. Now put it where it deserves to be, nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. Right underneath Jesus' arm, you could tack the piece of paper, the list of your guilt. And as the nail breaks its way through the flesh, it's pierced to the cross. You carry it no more. Your sin is atoned for, it's been redeemed. Yes, you might find yourself struggling, but you know what you need to do? You need to turn to heaven. This is about you reminding yourself of who you really are. We get so distracted in this life, we lose our identity. I was talking with a brother earlier on this week, and he was making the comment, he wanted to punch somebody in the face. He said, I was just frustrated. And he admitted, he's like, I got an attitude problem. But all I wanted to do was walk up and be like, no. Nah. I wasn't really going to do it. <laughs> and he said, in that moment, in that moment, I try to take a step back and ask the question, who am I? Because this man, he died, right? And is that not the picture that Scripture paints over and over and over and over and over again? That that man's dead. That man doesn't have choices. Yes, sometimes you put on the old self, but you do not live in the old self. You repent, you turn, you come back to the Savior because you are in Christ. It's where you are positioned. All right, so I want to imagine you guys as a group, all right? Look around. This is a body of Christ. You guys aren't looking around. Thank you. Okay. Joe, can you move over three seats? Yes. Joe has moved, but he's still in the body, right? This is going to be a horrible illustration, but I want you, I want you to follow with me here. <laughs> That's why you guys pay me the big bucks. <laughs> he's still in 
Christ. When you sin, you do not step out of grace. And then you repent and you come back into grace. And then you sin and you go out of grace. And then you repent and you come back into grace. What a teeter-totter. No wonder we're miserable within the church to Christ so often. Because this is the theology we teach. Well, I sinned and so God doesn't like me. He wants me back and so I repent and I come back to his presence. Well, that person made me say a cuss word and so I'm out again. I need to say a prayer and so head back in here. And you get exhausted. Because our salvation is not by grace. We have to find ourselves holding, clinging, Notice who does the work there in Isaiah. It's not Isaiah. The angelic being comes to him and says, dude, let me touch your lips with this. You're clean. You were a man of unclean lips. Now you've got clean lips. This is God's work. And so we rest in God's work. This is your identity. And so you rest in your identity. Not because you're working. You're working it out, right? It's been granted to you, and so you work it out. It's been given to you. You don't have to work for it. It's been been God's work. And this is where we find ourselves coming back to 1 Peter, the text that was done in our reading, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14 through 16. In that portion of text, Peter, reflecting on the call of those who believe, pulls Old Testament style and says, Be holy, for I am holy. You see the cause for our holiness? It's wrapped up in the one who's redeemed us. Actually, as you go on in that portion of the text, if you read on down, I believe it's verse 18, where Peter makes his case that it, it's been because of what Christ Jesus has done for you. It's a response. We have to reflect and we respond to this. This is what we do. Because of who we are. It's not something we are trying to strive to be. It is something you are. And so, you were born. You don't try to be a person after you're born. You've been born. You grow up, but life has already been given to you. And so, yeah, you need to grow up. I'll be the first one to admit we all need to grow up. But life has been given to us in Christ Jesus. And in the same breath, holiness has been given to us in Christ Jesus. And because he who is holy has called us to be holy, we will act in holiness. Trying to work out the holiness that has been given to us in Christ Jesus. Continuing on in that portion of text. Verse 8. You notice that when the holiness of God is received when atonement for sin is offered, there's a commission that comes with it. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Isaiah hits his knees and he says, oh God, I'll grovel like a worm to get there, but I'll do it. I'll try to make my way there and so I'll, I'll crawl on my knees and just, I just, I'm so unworthy for the work, God. 
No, the attitude is completely different. Notice, notice the text. Look at the text. Do you sense Isaiah saying, woe is me? No, Isaiah says, here am I. I'll go do it. You send me to the people of unclean lips because you have made me clean. I have been redeemed. I have been delivered. I have been transferred. It has been done for me. And I will stand, not in my righteousness, but in the one who has made me righteous. It is with these words I stand in boldness before you because my Savior has redeemed me. And so let me beg you for but one more moment. Do you still hold on to your sin? Really reflect. Do you still find yourself underneath the condemnation of the law? Scripture says that if our hearts condemn us, He, speaking of God, is greater than our hearts. And so I want to come back to this image. Unclean. At one point, you stepped into those waters and you were unclean. You got down there and you felt the weight and wrath of God. And you knew it. This is a cool thing about water that I love. There's just something about getting in it. Especially something like this where you just start getting the picture, don't you? that what was buried in there has stayed there? That you really are new? That your identity really is wrapped up in Christ? That the time and time and time again, you have given yourself a trip? That you're clean. You don't need to hold that burden anymore. What you need to do is stand like the citizen that you are because you've been commissioned. There's a message to an unclean world. And the message is this. The price has been paid. You do not need to try to be holy you will fail. God has come and he has offered holiness and peace and love and it's for sinners like you and a former broken man like me. This is your identity. Do not let go of it.